everyone. Welcome to the course on computer aided drug design. Today we are going to start a new topic that's called uh, target based drug design or uh, docking as it is popularly called. So far we looked at um, structure based uh, drug design that means we looked at uh, the uh, three dimensional structure of uh, the ligand, we looked at the physical chemical properties of the ligand, we looked at the pharmacoporic features of the ligand, we developed structure activity relationships. So we never knew anything about the target um, at which uh, this particular uh, drug is going to go and bind. It could be a protein or an enzyme um, or it could be a, a channel. So we never knew anything about it. Uh, so our focus has been only on the uh, chemi-informatic properties of the drug. Okay, now um, let's look at um, how the drug goes and acts on uh, enzyme or protein and makes the protein or enzyme inactive. Uh, so this protein uh, could be in the pathway of the particular disease process. Okay, so that means I need to know the mechanism of action um, of the particular disease. Um, and uh, I need to know what are those enzymes involved in that particular disease process and which enzyme I am going to target. Uh, so I need to know more. Uh, if you look uh, 15 or 20 years back, uh, there was uh, no knowledge about uh, much understanding about mechanism or target proteins and so on because our analytical tools were not very um, great. Uh, so most of the drugs were discovered based on their activity. For example, if you look at sulfur drug, uh, if you look at uh, penicillin, uh, they were tested on uh, bacteria, various types of bacteria and they were found to act very effectively. Uh, that means they were able to kill the bacteria, hence uh, the drugs came into market. Uh, but uh, nobody knew how they acted. But later on, a lot of research was done to understand how the drugs acted. The mechanism of action was understood. So in the past 15 years um, with the improvement in analytical tools, with the improvement in computational tools, uh, there was a lot of uh, possibilities of finding out uh, uh, how the drug acts and what are the targets involved uh, through which uh, the drug acts. That means uh, uh, which proteins get um, uh, disturbed or get inhibited because of this drug. So one was able to do that. Uh, by looking at uh, the target, uh, one can design very effectively or very efficiently um, drugs which may be very selective to the particular target. Uh, that means they may not go and bind to other targets. So you are reducing the side effect profile of the drug. Uh, so they can go and bind very effectively to the target um, and uh, stop uh, the disease uh, process. So the target based drug design looks at the specific uh, enzyme structure, uh, the active side of the enzyme and um, design the molecules which will go and bind very effectively, very selectively and not go and bind to other enzymes or proteins. Thereby they can become very selective as well as they could have better efficacy. So uh, this is what is called the target based drug design. That means uh, I need to know a lot about the mechanism. I need to know the three dimensional structure of the target protein or enzyme um, which uh, I want to focus on. I need to know the active site of this enzyme. And as I said, uh, in the past 15, 20 years, a lot of development has happened in proteomics, mass spectrometry, extra crystallography, NMR, computational tools, uh, protein purification separation just just as uh, like uh, the 2d gel electrophoresis so all these um, simultaneous development of uh, computational as well as experimental tools has helped quite a lot uh, uh, in um, going towards uh, the target based drug, drug design and as you see nowadays uh, FDA that is the Food and Drug Administration of US um, expects all the pharma companies uh, when they file a, a new chemical entity uh, to have the details about the mechanism of action as well as the target proteins on which the drug acts. They are not just happy about uh, the efficacy uh, of the compound but they would like to know exactly where the compound uh, goes and where it binds, which enzymes it uh, inhibits and so on actually. Okay. So for example, let's look at uh, this particular uh, picture. 
okay this is taken from this reference okay uh, this deals with the um, inflammatory pathway it's called uh, arachidonic acid pathway arachidonic acid pathway inflammation okay so there is a cell membrane um, phospholipids that are produced there is an um, phospholipidase enzymes which converts them at arachidonic as arachidonic acid okay so this is the uh, site of inflammation once AA is formed there are some enzymes like cyclooxygenase 1 cyclooxygenase 2 which uh, convert uh, the arachidonic acid okay into P, uh, PGH2 that is PGH2 here sorry as PGH2 here okay and uh, so PGH2 here and this PGH2 is acted upon a large number of enzymes uh, prostaglandin E synthase that's this one uh, which converts uh, the PGH2 into PGE2 okay so this is how the inflammation progresses okay inflammation vasodilation and so on this PGE2 goes to uh, EP receptors okay then there is a PGDS enzyme which converts that into PGD2 then there is a PGFS enzyme which converts into PGF and then there are thromboxanes then there is a PGIS enzyme which converts into PGI2 so the PGH2 is being converted by large number of enzymes um, to various products okay simultaneously we also have a uh, um, another enzyme called uh, lipoxygenase okay lipoxygenase which converts the arachidonic acid um, into 5-HETE which is involved in uh, uh, bronchospasm vasoconstriction okay so you have large number of enzymes in the arachidonic acid pathway uh, large number of enzymes in the arachidonic acid pathway uh, which are involved which are involved in uh, the inflammation, vasoconstriction, uh, const and uh, vasodilation, uh, okay, and so on actually. So if you look at uh, original inflammatory drug, aspirin uh, is uh, quite a good drug, okay, uh, which uh, is called a non-steroidal uh, anti-inflammatory drugs because originally uh, steroids were given um, for inflammation especially steroids act here um, so aspirin is a non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drug so it goes and acts on many of these enzymes cox1 cox2 so it's very not selective actually then came a uh, selective cox2 inhibitors um, i've been talking about it like bextra viox silicoxib roficoxib which will go and bind only to this uh, particular enzyme called cox2 okay uh, but not to other enzymes and then there are some drugs which may be targeting this there are some drugs which may be targeting this so um, uh, if you take a mechanistic pathway like inflammation one could target different enzymes to achieve different uh, um, um, okay scenarios okay one could uh, target uh, this enzyme alone one could target this enzyme alone or this enzyme or combination of this enzyme and this enzyme depending depending upon uh, what is uh, desired um, so then the target based uh, drug design comes into picture so i need to know something about the target protein uh, the size of the protein the active site of the protein and so on actually okay this is where the target based design comes into picture okay so that means i need to know something about the target uh, this mechanism mechanism I need to know uh, I need to know the uh, details about the target um, the structure uh, the sh shape the three-dimensional conformation the protein takes all these things I need to know that's uh, very very important and another important and uh, interesting thing is um, you may be discovering drugs for this enzyme COX2 there might be some companies which may be discovering drugs for uh, like oxygenase some companies may be trying to target both uh, cyclooxygenase 2 and lipoxygenase and so on actually so uh, for same inflammation uh, there could be uh, many companies working uh, towards different enzymes okay so this picture was taken from this reference
Okay, so uh, I need to know the protein or enzyme or whatever the target. I need to know that. That's very, very important. Okay, so the primary structure. So the proteins have four different structures. The primary, secondary, tertiary and quaternary. So the primary structure is the se sequence of the 20 amino acids in the polypeptide chain. Okay. It is held together by the peptide bond. What is that peptide bond? C double bond on end, right? So that's the peptide bond that's formed actually because you have the acid, we have the NH2, so they form a peptide bond. Um, secondary structure, this is very regular local substructures on the actual polypeptide backbone due to constraints on the backbone because uh, it is not possible for the backbone to form all types of uh, structures. Okay, uh, two main types we have that's the alpha helix and the beta strands or beta sheets as we can call it. Alpha helix or the beta strands or beta sheets. Okay, then uh, we have the uh, tertiary structure. These are real 3D structures of this monomeric uh, uh, protein. The alpha helices and beta sheets are folded into compact globular structure. So thermodynamically it forms a very compact structure. The folding is due to non-specific hydrophobic interactions. Okay, so we have the hydrophobic interactions um, which are generally uh, buried inside the hydrophobic interactions are buried inside because uh, as you know protein uh, uh, is generally found more in the water and um, so generally we have all the hydrophilic uh, uh, portions of the protein uh, coming out and the hydrophobic portion is always buried inside then you have the other uh, tertiary interactions are formed uh, salt bridges hydrogen bonds disulfide bonds so all these are formed that is why the protein uh, takes a uh, three-dimensional uh, globular compact structure okay so we have the uh, primary structure when you say it's only the 20 amino acids arranged uh, in the polypeptide chain okay by the peptide bond but when you have the secondary structure uh, these uh, regular local substructures because uh, the polypeptide bonds has some constraints on the backbone so it forms alpha helices or beta strands or beta sheets then we have the uh, tertiary uh, which is um, because of the hydrophobic non-specific hydrophobic interactions which are buried inside and other interactions such as salt bridges hydrogen bonds disulfide bonds are all these formed then we have the quaternary structure we may have uh, two or more individual these tertiary structures combined together okay to form because as a whole only they start uh, um, acting okay so for example hemoglobin is a tetramer if you take that um, five lipoxygenase which I showed you which is involved in uh, uh, in bronchoconstriction okay and also which is uh, a, which takes arachidonic acid as a substrate uh, it's a dimeric okay so uh, the quaternary structure may be aggregation of two or more individual polypeptides that is two or more tertiary structures connected together actually okay so they act accordingly uh, so the proteins have four different uh, levels i would say of structures okay okay phylox phylox lap oxygen is a dimer okay this uh, was taken uh, from these two references so it's a very interesting uh, picture uh, if you look at uh, some of these uh, amino acids like alanine valine leucine isoleucine okay methionine tryptophan they are all non-polar hydrophobic okay they are all hydrophobic so generally uh, they will be buried inside uh, in aqueous medium you generally have only the um, hydrophilic amino acids outside uh, these are polar uncharged okay cysteine glycine serine tyrosine glutamine look at that flow polar and charged okay because okay charge gets neutralized here as you can see polar charged aspartic acid okay so they can see a glutamic acid lysine <coughs> arginine 
interesting. So we have the polar charged, we have the polar uncharged, we have the hydrophobic protein. So the proteins are divided in, can be divided into these type of groups. Uh, so generally if you have a protein three-dimensional structure, the hydrophobic groups may be buried inside so the polar in charge or polar charged may be sticking out. So this uh, 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 interesting picture was taken from these two references. Okay, so uh, uh, the amino acids again, uh, this is a very um, diagram, okay, showing um, how the proteins could be grouped. We can uh, call it aliphatic protein, beta branched, aromatic, hydrophobic, polar, charged, positive, negative, showing the relationship to the 20 naturally occurring amino acids to the selection of physical chemical properties. Uh, the, these physical chemical properties determine the uh, <coughs> protein structure. So we could have a polar, we could have polar charged positive, polar charged negative, hydrophobic, aromatic, beta branch, aliphatic. So um, the, based on their amino acids, uh, we can guess what type of um, um, amino acid it's going to be and generally whether it will be pointing outside or inside. Okay, so uh, how do we get the protein uh, uh, three-dimensional structure? Um, about 15-20 uh, years back, there were no tools like proteomics, uh, so uh, protein structure was uh, not uh, known. But um, with a lot of uh, uh, development in the area of uh, two-dimensional di two gel electrophoresis, uh, then mass spec, mass spec, uh, tandem mass spec systems, uh, X-ray crystallography, uh, NMR, a um, lot of proteins are being crystallized and their structures are being determined. But still there is a lot of scope for doing research in uh, protein crystallization because it's not such a simple job. So if you look at uh, thousands and thousands of uh, proteins uh, that are involved in human diseases, we have only uh, structures, three-dimensional structures of good proteins which are um, one-tenth of that number okay because um, it's it may be very difficult to purify to a high degree the protein of our interest um, and then crystallize it and get the three-dimensional structure okay so the first step uh, uh, you have in the protein purification is the 2d gel it's called um, the 2d the two dimension one dimension is uh, the molecular weight to difference uh, su separates the protein other dimension is the iso isoelectric point you all know what is isoelectric point. This is the pH at which uh, protein is neutral. Um, so uh, if you have a pH gradient, protein start moving um, because of the charge and when it reaches the pH at which uh, the charge is uh, zero, it stops. Okay, And then um, the protein moves based on molecular weight uh, and uh, so the separation happens. So in a 2D gel, we, we get thousands of proteins separated we may pick up the protein of our interest and then uh, you um, put that into a mass spec a tandem mass spec system uh, mass spec mass spec with MALDI and so on um, so you get the molecular weight we can even cal find out the sequence of amino acids that means how the amino acids are placed uh, next to each other so we can get the uh, primary structure of the protein by this uh, approach which is quite simple um, if you want to know the three-dimensional structure, of course, we need to crystallize the protein. Okay, so crystallization is not so simple. Um, once you have sufficient amount of crystal protein, you, sub, uh, you pass it through X-ray uh, or uh, nuclear magnetic resonance. There is a lot of interest that's happening here um, because uh, this could be in the liquid form. That means protein could be in the solution. Okay, um, whereas this has to be crystallized. So this has more advantages so we can go down uh, to very high degree of accuracy and we can get that three-dimensional structure of the protein um, then you need to know the active side of the protein okay so many times uh, uh, when they crystallize protein they um, put in an inhibitor or the substrate and crystallize so um, when you do the uh, crystal uh, structure determination we get the uh, structure of the protein as well as the ligand or substrate which is uh, 
um, bound to the protein. So that advantage, that's a very good advantage to have a ligand because such a protein protein ligand complex is more stable than the protein alone because the active site may collapse uh, if uh, there is uh, no ligand or if there is no substrate uh, bound to the protein active site. So it's a good idea to generally um, crystallize with the ligand or with the substrate bound to the protein. Um, it's also good when we are doing um, docking studies uh, when we know where the substrate or the uh, ligand has gone and bound we can take that as the active site um, when you are doing a docking we can remove uh, that ligand and try to put uh, new molecules uh, and see whether they um, bind better uh, and so on actually so these are the various steps by which uh, protein um, three-dimensional structure is determined and as I said in the past 15-20 uh, years um, with the uh, improvement in the experimental tools more proteins are getting crystallized uh, with substrates and ligands and drugs and their crystal structures are being determined okay so if you go to a PDB protein data bank PDB protein data bank you'll be able to see a lot of proteins um, and uh, you'll be able to see uh, uh, their structures okay and so it's very interesting to um, have a look at uh, this okay. if you have an uh, internet here we will be able to see Yeah, this is a cyclooxygenase 2. Um, it gives you a lot of information. Uh, in addition, uh, plus the references from which uh, protein was downloaded. Okay, so um, you can get the 3D structure. Um, of this protein which we can download for our uh, further studies um, if uh, we want to perform docking for example um, then uh, we need to have the PDB structure Okay, these are some uh, beta lactamase type of uh, systems. Okay, so um, as you can see, they are called uh, so we can see um, a little beta lactamase with the meropenem. This meropenem is an aerobic uh, in the red, which which is uh, bound to that. So we get the information. Then uh, we will also get. Uh, um, structure we can even explore the structure and there are a lot of uh, references that are uh, yeah here we can even rotate uh, uh, the protein as you can see here um, so we can rotate this is the software js mole uh, this is uh, you antibiotics okay so a lot of uh, information is uh, given about uh, this uh, protein and what it interacts with um, as I said there are two enzymes one is called the cyclooxygenase 1 and the other one is called uh, cyclooxygenase 2 okay this is uh, the 1 PTH okay this is the prostaglandin H2 synthase uh, or the COX it is, as it is called okay yeah okay so you 
can see um, I think aspirin bound or what let's see what is it bound So these are the ligands that are bound to the uh, this particular okay ligands in pocket these are the pocket surrounding there so a lot of information uh, can be got this is the space filling model you can see the ligands or an yellow color there um, yeah. so this uh, PDB is a very powerful uh, protein data bank or uh, protein database it contains large number of uh, uh, three-dimensional structures of uh, protein we can uh, if we know the area which we are working on and if you know which uh, protein we want it um, we can download it's all um, based on for example this uh, prostaglandin um, H2 synthase this is called 1PTH um, but you may have a different uh, prostaglandin H2 synthase also found here there could be um, depending upon uh, how many researchers have got the crystal structure uh, from maybe from urine or from other uh, species and uh, they might have uh, um, crystallized with the uh, other uh, ligands okay other substrates so you may have uh, many um, references to this prostaglandin H2 synthase and depending upon your area of interest you may take up uh, that uh, three-dimensional structure of that particular uh, protein of uh, your interest okay so that's the beauty of uh, this uh, PDB mm. so it's a uh, very useful uh, and uh, we are going to use that quite a lot as we go along because um, the three-dimensional crystal structure of the protein um, and the active side of the protein are very very essential uh, for us to um, uh, use in uh, docking softwares and we are going to use docking softwares like, such as AutoDock or SwissDock um, where uh, we get the 3D structure of this uh, protein of interest and then uh, look at uh, different drugs and start uh, placing them in the active side and uh, see how the docking uh, takes place okay so that way this PDB uh, database is protein data bank or protein database is very very essential for us okay so uh, we will uh, continue more uh, in the later classes on uh, the concept of uh, um, target based design or docking okay thank you very much for your time